My great pleasure to introduce Josh Nile, who's going to give the next talk, and I, I don't think I need to introduce him further than to say that from today, he's director of the Whipple Museum for the History of Science in Cambridge University. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike. Um, thank you, yes, I have the um, challenge of talking about extraterrestrial life. I'm going to open with um, a couple of very quick apologies. Um, the, the first is that I, something occurred to me while I was um, sitting here. When I was um, chair of the Royal Astronomical Society's Heritage Committee, they changed their logo away from having the, the Whipple 40-foot telescope, a decision that I was not entirely happy with. And then I realized that while I've been working at the Whipple Museum, we changed our logo. It used to be our Herschel 10-foot telescope. And then about five years ago, we changed it to this orrery symbol. So I, I, I feel like I owe an apology to the Herschel family, but I've been involved in the erasure of two uses of Herschel telescopes and symbols. I, let me apologize. Uh, the more serious apology is that I'm not actually a historian of, of William Herschel. So uh, my rather twisted my arm to do this, but much of what I'm about to say is, is, is lifted with, with love and all due credit from a number of scholars much cleverer than myself particularly um, uh, Michael Crow, uh, the historian of extraterrestrial life, Michael Hoskin, obviously, and, and Simon Schaffer. So I thank those scholars, yes. Thank you. We face a problem when talking about William Herschel, and this is the problem, which is that he's widely regarded as, as we've heard this morning, arguably the greatest astronomer, greatest, certainly, observational astronomer who's ever lived, and yet there is this massive red flag seemingly hanging over his career, which is that he was a Bourbon advocate for the belief in extraterrestrial life. And so we've tended to see characterizations of Herschel that appear a bit like this one from Arthur Eddington, the great astronomer, who noted that it cannot be denied that Herschel was given to jump to conclusions in ways which when it comes off we describe as profound insights, and when it does not come off we call wildcat speculation. What I want to do today is try and persuade you that this characterization of Herschel is wrong. That in actual fact, we shouldn't bifurcate his career into bits that we think are brilliant and bits that we think are rather odd. That's to commit the sin of historical anachronism. Rather, we need to understand him on the terms of the 18th century. And on those terms, his belief in extraterrestrial life is far from odd. So really what I want to argue today is two related things. The first is the Georgian belief in extraterrestrial life was neither unusual or aberrant. And the other is that Herschel's search for extraterrestrial life was a core component of his research program and therefore has to be understood on those terms as integral to all of the work that he did. So the place obviously to begin is with the culture in which uh, Herschel found himself becoming immersed and interested in astronomy in the 1760s, 1770s. And this was a period, Michael Crow has argued, where belief in extraterrestrial life was the dominant position in the Western Hemisphere. Which is to say, if you didn't believe in extraterrestrial life, you were the ones being a little bit obtuse. And there's ample evidence for this. One of the really obvious places to look is one of William Herschel's favorite books, one of the most influential books on his nascent career as an astronomer. And this is this book by James Ferguson. We've heard about it already today. Astronomy Explained on Sir Isaac Newton's Principles. Ferguson was a hugely influential popularizer of astronomy in the mid 18th century. And we know that William Herschel was heavily influenced by this book. And here, for example, is what James Ferguson has to say about the moon. On the surface of the moon, because it is nearer to us than any other celestial bodies are, we discover a near resemblance of our Earth. For, by the assistance of telescopes, we observe the moon to be full of high mountains, large valleys, deep cavities. These similarities leave us no room to doubt that all the planets and moons in the system are designed as commodious habitation for creatures endowed with capacities of knowing and adoring their beneficent creator. Underlying this kind of claim are a number of core principles, which we might call philosophical principles or we might call theological principles. And these principles are widely influential amongst scientists, astronomers in the 18th century. 
The first of these we call the Copernican principle. This is the idea that in the wake of the Copernican revolution, the literal and metaphorical centrality of the Earth is removed. It's very easy when you think the Earth is stationary at the center of the universe to think that the Earth is entirely exceptional. Copernicus removes that stance of exceptionalism. The Earth becomes just another planet orbiting just another star. So if we take a kind of position that the Earth is not exceptional, then we start to realize that whatever happens on Earth can probably be extended out to all and any other planets that might orbit all and any other stars, which can be just like our sun. The second key principle is called the principle of plenitude, and this is a theological principle. This is the principle that God would not waste space or matter, and in fact, rather, that the creation of all and any materials in the universe are deliberately done by God to show the glory of his creation. So why would he do that and create all of the stars that we can see and then leave them completely devoid of life? This was judged to be theologically improbable, not least because it was deemed that uh, living matter, the creations of Earth, were the highest sign of God's power and authority. And related to those two principles, we have a general position, which we might call the argument from analogy, which is that given the Copernican principle and the principle of plenitude, it is reasonable for us to make a judgment that other celestial objects are fundamentally similar to Earth. And we have to remember here, this is before spectroscopy, so there is no experimental evidence that can vouchsafe the claim that any celestial object is made of the same material as on Earth. To make that claim is to make a philosophical or a theological leap, because we don't know, for at least another hundred years, that actually celestial objects can be shown spectroscopically to be made of the same material. So taking these principles, we see a wide number of people in the 18th century making very strident claims for the existence of extraterrestrial life. Not only that, but we see philosophers, the greatest philosopher of the 18th century, Immanuel Kant, for example, you can see actually constructs a chain of being for creation, which does not put humans at the top. He says humans are probably somewhere in the middle, and as Earth is somewhere in the middle of the solar system, he creates a hierarchy where he says that the creatures that live on Mercury and Venus are dullards, they're idiots, but the creatures that live on Jupiter and Saturn are far superior to anything that will be found on Earth. So Herschel comes into his program of astronomical observation having been imbued with these ideas. To understand what he then does with them, we have to begin by understanding the nature of his observational program. So I'm actually going to start here, not with his direct observational claims about extraterrestrial life, but actually to make a broader point about his observational program, which is that it's a new, it's a novel program, it's a novel way of practicing astronomy, which is really important for understanding what he then says about extraterrestrial life. A number of historians of astronomy have pointed out that one way of thinking about William Herschel is to think of him as a natural historian of the heavens, and this indeed is actually a way that Herschel himself articulated. Herschel is aiming to study and observe new celestial objects and then classify them in new typologies, new series, much like a natural historian who studies strata in rocks or uh, a range of plant species might do. And here I think it's important to note that at this point that he's developing this program, he's very active in this society, the Bath Philosophical Society, as it was then called, which was full of natural historians, and he's conversing and reading their works. And so he himself articulates his own work in this way. This is him in 1789 describing his work. He says, the heavens are now seen to resemble a luxury garden which contains the greatest variety of productions in different flourishing beds. And one advantage we may at least recap from it is that we can, as it were, extend the range of our experience to an immense duration. So his project for classifying the various classes of nebulae objects is in part a natural historical program. He wants to bring them into one coherent system, which he says articulate different stages in the life cycle 
of nebulae and stars, controlled by gravity over very long durations of time. So this is a new kind of astronomy. And importantly, this new kind of astronomy doesn't have to play by the same rules as traditional positional astronomy, where more or less all of the observational evidence is known and within the bounds of observation. As a natural historian, Herschel makes the point that the naturalist does not think himself obliged to account for all the phenomena he may observe. The astronomer and optician may claim the same privilege. This is a bold claim. The astronomers at Royal Greenwich Observatory would never in a million years say such a bold thing. And one of the reasons is that with this claim comes something which is natural to the natural historian, but not to the astronomer, and that is cosmological speculation. So here's how Herschel himself puts it. Rather denigrating, I think, his colleagues in Greenwich, he said, if we add observation to observation without attempting to draw not only certain conclusions, but also conjectural views from them, we offend against the very end to which observations ought to be made. Conjectural views is crucial here. It's crucial for understanding the extraordinary work he's able to do with the nebulae, but it's also important for understanding his views on extraterrestrial life. So let's look at some specific examples. The place to start is actually with his early fascination with the moon. We saw with Ferguson's book that Ferguson highlights the moon as a possible seat of life, and Herschel himself is very interested in discovering whether he can find observational evidence for life on the moon. So he brings his program, a blend of incredible observational skill and, and also telescope making skill, and cosmological speculation to observations of the moon relatively early in his career. And this is a wonderful extract. We've seen this diagram already. This is an extract from his lunar notebook from 1776. And this in private is him wrestling with what he thinks might be evidence of something living on the moon. And you see, struck by the appearance of something, it could be an optical fallacy, but it appears to be a growing substance, which is what he views here. I'll not call them trees from their size, but they seem to be moving, growing. I now believe a forest, this word being also taken in its proper extended significance as consisting of such large growing substances. So privately, he's starting to develop ideas that he might see evidence for life on the moon. But importantly, he's also hedging. He's being quite cautious. He's not just playing forward and saying, hey, everyone, I found evidence for life on the moon. But he does eventually go public. In 1780, the very first paper that he has read before the Royal Society is a paper called Astronomical Observations Relating to the Mountains of the Moon. The Royal Society at this point, bear in mind, 1780, this man is just a musician in Bath who appears to have extraordinary capacity for building telescopes. And that's why the Royal Society are interested in reading his paper, because if he's not lying, he appears to have telescopes more powerful than any in existence, which of course we now know to be true. And in that paper, he says, knowledge of the construction of the moon leads us insensibly to several consequences, such as the great probability, not to say almost absolute certainty, of her being inhabited. And this is published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. This raises the attention of the Astronomer Royal, Neville Maskelyne. Neville Maskelyne writes to Herschel and asks him for an explanation as to his claim that the moon is inhabited. And there's a good reason that an astronomer like Maskelyne might be skeptical, because Maskelyne may well have believed in life on other planets in the solar system or other planets in the universe. But life on the moon is really pushing it, and that's because if you observe the occultation uh, of a star behind the moon, the star remains a completely crisp observational object right up to the point that it is occulted by the moon. What do we conclude from that? The moon appears to have no discernible atmosphere whatsoever. So by the time that Herschel is writing this, many astronomers have already pointed out, well, if there is life on the moon, it doesn't appear to be uh, living in what we would call any form of atmosphere. So Herschel, in uh, so masculine rights asking for clarification. Herschel responds with one of the, the great puns in the history of science. He begs masculine not to label him a lunatic. But he sticks to his guns. 
And this is what he says to Masculine. Seeing as our Earth is inhabited and comparing the moon with this planet, finding that in such a planet there is a provision for light and heat, also in all appearances a soil proper for habitation full as good as ours, if not perhaps better, who can say that it's not extremely probable, nay, beyond doubt, that there must be inhabitants on the moon of some kind or other question? Moreover, is it not perhaps altogether so certain that the moon is out of the reach of observation in this respect? I hope and am convinced that sometime or other very evident signs of life will be discovered on the moon. Michael Crow has gone so far as to say that this hope of discovering life on the moon may have been one of the drivers for his early works to develop more powerful telescopes. It's notable that he doesn't start his work on nebulae early in his observing career. A lot of his early notes are observations on the moon. So it may have been that he was building better and better telescopes so that he could find this hoped for evidence of life, the hope for evidence of what James Fergus had claimed in his book. But it's also important to note that Herschel remains careful to keep this within the bounds of observational astronomy. He does not see himself as a theological or a philosophical speculator. And so he ultimately spends years observing the moon, but he never publishes any claimed observational evidence for life on the moon. And we have a wonderful letter that he sends to a friend in Scotland, Wilson, in 1783, where he confesses that the attempts of finding traces of animation in the moon has now been five or six years. One of those I have endeavoured to render practicable, and though I have met with no self-evident or ocular demonstration of the moon's being inhabited, yet do I still hope that a good many of my observations will at least render the reasons we may allege from analogy more forcible. So we see here his scientific methodological position laid out very clearly. You need direct observational evidence, but you must also be open to basing your speculations on a basis from analogy. And does he keep looking for life on the moon? Well, I think to a large extent, the full exploration of his lunar notebooks awaits its historian, although Michael Crow has done a decent uh, job on this. But one thing that I think is particularly telling is something that Michael Hoskin uncovered relatively recently, which is this outtake from the Bath Chronicle from April 1793. This is an article in the Bath Chronicle saying, Mr. Herschel is now said, by the aid of his powerful glasses, to have reduced to a certainty the opinion that the moon is inhabited. He has discovered land of water, and he has distinguished an edifice apparently of great magnitude in St. Paul's, and he is confident of shortly being able to give an account of its inhabitants. It's not known the source for the journalist. Michael Hoskin speculates that it's William's brother, Alexander, who possibly maybe had one too many drinks down the pub with one too many journalists. But this news spreads widely. If you put this text into Google, you get hits for a whole load of American newspapers who publish, republish this story six months later because newspapers get transported by boat in packets to the US and then there's no copyright control. US newspapers freely pilfer from the British news. And so you find things like the Kansas Star in, in like September of 1793 reporting this story. So it's a newsworthy piece, but it's also notable, not so extraordinary as to cause shock or amazement. It's just a matter of fact that perhaps soon Herschel will publish that evidence. And as we can see, Herschel remained disappointed that he couldn't quite fulfill this promise. His attention then turns to the sun. And it's in the sun that we find a second seat of potential life. Now, Herschel, like most astronomers, philosophers, theologians of the period, believe this entirely uncontroversial statement, which is that the sun is just another star. And therefore, like all stars, it sustains a system of planets which 
will, all stars will likely have numberless globes inhabited by living creatures. That, so far, so uncontroversial. But then, he starts a research program into the structure of the strun and the structure of sunspots. And this is because he, as part of his developing ideas around the classification of nebulae, and the idea that nebulae represent a unified system, a cosmological system at different stages, which broadly goes from nebulous matter condensing down into planetary nebulae, which then collapse in on themselves, which form stars, and then stars form star clusters. And he, he, he goes back and forth through his career about whether he believes in true nebulosity versus star clusters, but that's the general gist. The importance for us is that what he's trying to do is to develop one coherent system predicated on a model of a unified form of laws, including a unified system of matter. And one of the things that Simon Schaffer has argued is that important for that system is the idea that some of this matter is what he calls vital matter, which is to say matter sustainable, uh, capable of sustaining life. And remarkably, he starts to leap to the conclusion that suns aren't only able to sustain life on planets, but suns themselves may not be in any material sense distinct from planets. So sunspots are a key source of evidence. He tells the Bath Philosophical Society in 1780 that he's skeptical that the sun is just a ball of uh, what he calls entire clear flame. He says the contrary is provided by the observation of so many spots, which indicate plainly that under the outward flaming surface is most probably contained a solid glow of unignited matter. And so the theory he comes up with is this, and you can see, I should add that these figures are from a paper he publishes in the Philosoph Proceedings of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. So the most preeminent science journal in the English language world publishes this paper. It has these sunspot observations, and he argues that what you're looking at here is a cool, solid interior to the sun, an upper layer on the outer surface of the sun, which emits light and heat, and then an inner layer, a reflecting layer, which reflects the light and heat out so that the solid core of the sun is actually cool. And he says that you can see this by carefully observing the structure of sunspots. So you can see how he's labeled up the, the parts here that you're seeing around the limb of the hole, and then this outer area, and you can see how that relates here. So it's a very carefully argued observational argument. And the sun, viewed in this light, he says, appears to be nothing else than a very eminent, large and lucid planet, evidently the first, or in strictest of speaking, the only primary one of our system, all others being truly secondary to it. Its similarity to the other globes of the solar system with regard to its solidity, its atmosphere and its such diversified surface, the rotation upon its axis and the fall of heavy bodies leads us to suppose that it is most probably also inhabited, like the rest of the planets, by beings whose organs are adapted to the peculiar circumstances of that vast globe. So it's an extraordinary claim to be making in the Phil Trans in 1795, but it's published, it's widely debated. The idea of a cool center to the sun becomes the dominant position as to the likely structure of the sun, even if the position that it's inhabited is highly debated and controversial. But it's evidence, importantly, of what Herschel is doing when he's making these linked observations between nebulae, moon, planets, sun. We saw earlier from Wolfgang particularly the range of observations he's making. My argument is in part, he's making these observations to construct a unified cosmological system. And it's a unified cosmological system which is animated by the same theory uh, it, the, the, the cosmological system, the planets and the stars, as I say, are both animated by the same theory of vital matter controlled by gravity. So to quote my colleague Simon Schaffer, both planets and stars therefore become capable of supporting that most dramatic manifestation of vitality, intelligent life. So that's the cosmological system that I think that Herschel is constructing. That's one of the reasons he's so interested in nebulae in my opinion, in the opinion of other scholars like Michael Crown and Simon Schaffer. 
Importantly for Herschel, this means for him, extraterrestrial life has now gone from a question of philosophical or theological debate to a matter of observational science. This is important for him to point out, and so he points it out directly. He says, whatever fanciful poets might say in making the sun the abode of blessed spirits or angry moralists devise in pointing out as it has a fit place for the punishment of the wicked, it does not appear that they have any other foundation for their assertions than mere opinion and vague surmise. However, now I think myself authorized upon astronomical principles to propose this sun as an inhabitable world, and I'm persuaded that the foregoing observations with the conclusions I've drawn from them are fully sufficient to answer every objection that may be made against it. So there is his final answer to why is he interested in extraterrestrial life, because it is a fundamental component of his observational program authorized upon astronomical principles. A brief coda, the briefest of codas to this story. His son, John, we've heard about, becomes arguably the most famous, the most powerful, the most influential scientist of the mid-Victorian era. John is deeply committed to furthering his father's work, his father's observational program. We've heard that he reconstructs the 20-foot telescope in South Africa to observe the southern skies. He also writes incredibly successful and influential works of popular astronomy, particularly his a treatise on astronomy, a, a, a single volume work attempting to give a kind of soup, soup to nuts account of astronomical knowledge as it exists in 1833. And here is what he has to say about extraterrestrial life. He is unambiguous. A person must have studied astronomy to little purpose who can suppose man to be the only object of his creator's care, or who does not see in the vast and wondrous apparatus around us provision for other races of animate beings. Herschel, however, would soon find this coming back to bite him somewhat when, shortly after arriving in South America, South Africa, he gets drawn into the man-bat controversy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to end my account here with one of the more colourful and exciting episodes of extraterrestrial life in the 19th century, when the New York Sun, an upstart newspaper from the Penny Press in New York, it's a, it's a tabloid, it's, it's uh, uh, with a relatively low circulation, in August 1835, publishes a series of accounts called Great Astronomical Discoveries, claiming that John Herschel has arrived in South Africa, set up his telescope, and has observed man-bats flying around on the moon. Mm -hmm. Now, some have argued that this was just a piece of gutter journalism trying to get more sales. Michael Crow has argued that it was actually an attempt to satirize astronomical popularizers who spoke too openly about extraterrestrial life. So we see it kind of as part of a cultural commentary one thing is certain is that picking John Herschel as the person who is claimed to have observed the man bats was very clever because of course in 1835, this is before trans, um, undersea cable telegraphy, the one person who doesn't know that any of this is going on is John Herschel. And so we have to wait until well after the event. We have him writing to his sister on, in January 1837, complaining that he's been pestered in all quarters with that ridiculous hoax about the moon in English, French, Italian, and German. This, I'm sure, is not where John wanted the arguments about extraterrestrial life to end up, but he would have been frustrated in part because, as we've seen, he was very much open to the idea that it did exist throughout the universe. He just didn't think it existed on the moon, unlike his father. But this debate rages on and on, and there's a whole, I could give a talk of greater length about what happens after this in the 19th century, because it by no means closes down uh, the, the whether there's life in the universe beyond the moon, the next place that becomes the, the center of debate is Mars, uh, rages all through uh, the 19th century. So that's my overview of William's belief in extraterrestrial life, but I hope I've persuaded you that he wasn't a lunatic. Thank you for listening.
Questions? Uh, who was Whipple? Did he invent Whipple's disease? No. Uh, Robert Whipple was um, uh, a, a local Cambridge industrialist who, who um, was director of the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company. And in 1944, he donated his personal collection of instruments to Cambridge uh, on the condition that they found a museum. So he was just a local industrialist, um, not not the Canadian Whipple. The, the the Whipple disease guy, I think, is from Canada. Or the Fred Whipple of COVID. Yes, not or the Fred Whipple. He's not the Fred Whipple of. And sometimes we get Izzy Frank Whipple. They're like, is this the jet engine guy? So none of none of those. None of those. Can you add Monty Python? Uh, yes. Um, there was a piece in the bulletin of the site which was from a year or two back about the precursor of things, Moon and Story, which I think to memory dates from 1829. And I'm forgetting that this piece in the newspaper, and we only have that second hand from, I think it's an Irish newspaper, and then at the time of the Apollo Moon Landings. And the correspondent wrote in to say, there are men on the moon. In, I think it was 1829. Um, I don't know whether you, whether you know anything about that. Uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know that, that specific story, but I think that it's revealing of a vibrant dialogue within newspapers in particular about extraterrestrial life. and. One of the things that you see happen with these popular positions, and we see it in the Bath Chronicle piece from 1893, is that the newspapers tend to be very interested in wherever the likelihood of extraterrestrial life being can be evidenced and is therefore kind of about to be revealed. So the moon is the center, the locus of that in the late 18th century and early 19th century, because that's within telescopic observational range. The reason it jumps to Mars is that after the 1860s, on the one hand, you have spectroscopy, and unfortunately for, for, for poor William Huggins, William Huggins, one of his first spectroscopic observations is that he declares that he's detected water on Mars, um, which we now know was data incorrect, um, erroneous uh, results. But also telescopes get much more powerful in the last quarter of the 19th century. And then the newspapers, suddenly start talking about the imminent discovery of life on Mars, which if you read about, you can buy a book called News from Mars, which I wrote. <laughs> well, yes, here. Yeah. In support of your position, um, there were no links between, oh, excuse me, in support in support of your position, there were, there were no links until about a hundred years after Herschel's peak productions of any any link between optical phenomena and temperature. Certainly not until about the 1880s. Of course, Herschel had seen this by discovering infrared radiation, which later became very important. Well, and obviously that, that, is, that means that his, his view on, on um, the moon having a cool center is, is much more viable, under, as you say, under those conditions. Um, yeah. Yes, two more questions here. Sorry, can you answer me to a mask? That's fine. Yeah, um, yeah just comment. So I think that... His comments were very scientific about um, the uh, universe or existence being a uh, widely, essentially described it as light and matter uh, controlled by gravity. That's principally what existence is. I mean, when energy or is into matter, um, and that gives the basis for formation of and further formulations and so organisms develop as, as higher up in the evolution of creation, evolution of creation of matter. So on that basis, uh, light that we are on Earth are familiar with is light that's used to the temperature range and, you know, um, existential, um, 
one another. That's the familiar with. But it doesn't preclude uh, the existence of organisms that can adapt to other external circumstances. Right, and, and you saw that in the sun quote, right? Um, let me jump. Um, uh, by being since organs are adapted to the peculiar circumstances of that vast globe. And this is all well before um, exactly. Darwin's theory of evolution. So obviously evolutionary concepts are in play in the 18th century, but um, there's very much a, a recognition that um, I think in Herschel's work, and I completely agree with you that I think he's, he's very scientific about this, that, that um, it's perfectly plausible by analogy to surmise that creatures on other planets will not be like humans. And he says, uh, Herschel says, and other, plenty of other people point out, we just look at the diversity of life on Earth. Look at where things can live on Earth. They can live in the sky, they can live in the deep sea. They, they, there are all kinds of conditions. Um, and so that's part of the kind of analogy, which, as I say, was widely made and was not particularly it was not particularly controversial to make this analogy from looking at forms of life on earth uh, and projecting the plausibility elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time now, so we must move on to the next presentation. Okay. Round the table, the next thing is ten to um, four. Um, and uh, so I'm going to stop if you want one because uh, a lot of people get stick up. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, then it'd be a shame not to bring them all together um, and see who it gets to in some sort of you know, informal uh, question and answer session and come discussion. Uh, and I'm uh, glad that Jim can join us too. Um, I love you. Um, so no, we can all be here. But, um, so at some point, I shall open this without a sort of question point. I would say a bit real about the actual story uh, and what it's taken to do. So it's not your most deep fundamental question about astronomy. This is an aspect of Um I don't want to go down too many you know, non herschel rabbits. So, um, uh, I'm going to start off actually by asking our, our speakers if they have any thoughts that sort of come to them, like, from having listened to others or from the events of the day. And, uh, why not? And, uh, and, uh, my thought of a person that they take a particular question. So, yeah. oh gosh. Um, and yeah. I mean, we need you to invite, by the way, as a part of Yeah, I, What's extraordinary, I suppose, is how here we are 200 years after his death, and yet talking about new things and new ways of looking at it and this legacy. I, the, the last talk certainly shows how positional astronomy, which was the mainstream uh, astronomy at the time, has sort of gone away almost and come back again. You know, it's cyclic. It's absolutely fascinating. I'm just, I'm, I'm just blown away by what Guy can do in terms of uh, functionality, and you know how how things do instrumental advances in their own time bring completely new insights. Um, and also, but how 200 years after William Herschel, we're still learning, apparently, about. His techniques and what he did. I mean, the, the stuff Jim was telling us this morning about uh, his, you know, his, his way about how he actually ground his mirrors and that he recorded that. You know, where's the book? You know, um, by Tuesday, please, Jim. Okay. Uh, 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 you know, uh, and there must be other things too that, that you know, there, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to, to put this in, in, in real context. Uh, also, Maybe we, uh, and I thought very interesting too was Josh's view about him, about, you know, I've read about Herschel, nutty, nutty um, William and his uh, green men on, 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 on the moon. But, you know, putting it into context, no, it wasn't nutty at all, was it? Really? And that was the view. And it's how 
you, you can't you have to be careful when doing historical studies that you don't bring your 20th or 21st century view to what's sensible and what isn't only because what survives is what subsequently turns out to be correct and that's not really the way science works the correctness survives but the process requires sorting of all sorts of different ideas and i found that very interesting Thank you. Okay. Uh, so i think what we learned is that Herschel mm -hmm. is a multi-dimensional multi-talented person which is maybe not on earth in, in current times no? because it's so uh, specialized now we see it in, in the Gaia mission how many people are involved with how many specialists uh, need are needed for for this test and uh with easy the man making astronomy or making astrometry or uh, making natural history of the heavens no? are are not not there at the moment and so what we have to do is to to recover all these things and bring it to the present situation mm -hmm. and uh, make clear what these men have done for us mm -hmm. and there's a, a straight line from him to you uh, astronomy astrometry because astronomy astronomy astrometry was not his main purpose he was much criticized by his, uh, by people uh, being professional astronomers at that time, having a uh, very accurate uh, um, measurement methods and, and telescopes, and so refractors with with, with uh, uh, circles, and so you know, to, to get the positions. But Herschel was innovative in much more ways than these traditional astronomers has had ever ever uh, an idea about. No? So this is the the main fact which meets. Which is presented here and bring it to the audience and bring it to your mind and to see what have what Herschel has really done in this wide wide spectrum of of uh, uh, physical or astronomical astronomical or whatever purposes. No? So that's that's what I it's my feeling here that you must must yeah share this view with us. No? That's that's what we have to do to, all together. Okay, thank you. Sean, may I with you? So, like many of us in the room, one of the most striking discoveries was a set of books in the archives that I've been looking for, looking after for several years. I, I didn't, I've never even looked in them. <laughs> um, the, the polishing records that Jim Bennett um, described so cleverly this morning. So, the one, one thing that I want to do when I go back to work is take one of the specular mirrors and that, that happened to be in the collection, put it in a display case next to the polishing records and just show it to some people. Let's bring it to light. And, and I look forward to like hit, um, reading more in-depth research but from, from Jim Bennett. Uh, and just generally to, to make a link between that and other um, discussions today. Uh, so Jim's talking about the records of hours and hours of polishing. Um, Wolfgang Steinecker was talking about the hours and hours of research. Those graphs really brought into sharp relief this, the huge peak of activity of observation hours that William Caroline carried out in 1784 and, and the impact of other interests in his life. It's this diachronic study of the efforts of a whole lifetime and the context that we've been given is so important. We can't just look at individual moments of discovery. It's the efforts and and you know, the, the scientific practice over a whole lifetime. And these are really brought home to me. Yeah. And at the risk of, of being rather biased, as I'm, I'm both a historian and someone who works in the museum, I, I, to me, the thing that, that really struck me is the, the value of the documents and source materials that we have that, that bring the story of William Herschel's life back to us. And at the risk of sounding slightly polemical, I think it's, um, it's very easy to, to think, oh, well, we're very lucky that we have all of these materials. But actually, of course, it's not luck. It takes a huge amount of work, uh, particularly hidden labor, to make sure that these materials both survive but are also cared for and also can be studied. So my kind of 
the, the thing that strikes me is, is, you know, how fortunate we are for, that we have institutions like the Herschel Museum, like uh, Sean's work at the Royal Astronomical Society, because without that work, a lot of which, as I say, 95% of it is completely hidden from view. As historians, we wouldn't be able to do the work that, that we can do. Um, what fascinates me most of all, I think, and what really comes over, is the fact that Herschel was an independent operator. Until he became the king's astronomer, he actually literally had everything to do for himself. And in this respect, he was not unique. All other astronomers, English, of that day, had to do the same thing. Tried their own equipment and so on. And indeed, although Herschel was given 200 pounds a year by King George III, and Caroline received 50, that was not as much as he was making before, because he was making a lot of money out of music, and it must have been literally a cut of salary for him. He actually plugged that hole by the very, very lucrative means of selling sample telescopes, which there was an enormous demand. There's one in the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, and it still survives with its original bill, 100 guineas. Now, Mr. Foot didn't make the whole thing himself. We know he employed carpenters, caster makers, brass catch makers, and he basically put the finishing touches on the mirror. He also actually had quite a business in making telescopes to sell. Not to mention the consciously expensive one he sold to the King of Spain and to the Prince of Camino in Italy, which would charge him the thousands of pounds. Now, when you bear in mind during Herschel's time, you could get a cook for 10 pounds a year, and you get 100 pounds for a group of men who were organizing making telescopes, then you weren't doing bad. Herschel clearly was a very, very impressive figure. And why you may wonder, did John not need a paid job ever in his life? Mm. And nearly had to have his arm off his back by Palmerston, the Prime Minister, before he became master of the mint at the age of 58. Why was that? Because he had not only his mother's money to fall back on, he also has his dad as well. And I've looked through some of his account books and things like that. And he knew how to make money as well as how to make discoveries. So Herschel fascinates me too as a social type. And you have a great question. Yes, yes. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Michael. Well, I, I, I came not knowing in what about, I'm sure I should be honest, but there sort of be things struck me and, uh, Maybe I just throw them open for further consideration. I mean, the first was, I, I did ask over Coffey what was known about him, his personality, what was he like as a person. We haven't touched on that very much, but I wonder what, what his memory was like. Um, and someone asked whether he was able to recognize the sky, in, you know, from his previous observations. And I think probably the, the, could there be a connection there between musicians who often have a very formidable memory which works in some ways, you know, could that be partly responsible for his... his, his uh, right. that, that, that was the first thing. Uh, the second, I'm going to quote Alan from your own book, because Jim, Jim talked at length about compiling these, uh, I think Jim talking about compiling these instructions or recipes for, for, for Mirror, Brian, and he never got around publishing it. And Alan, you pointed out that until, I quote, until the late 18th century, the art of graduation, that is, measuring uh, angles, had been carried out in secrecy and silence. And could it have been that he never really intended to publish these, but, you know, was using them to, for his financial advantage? I mean, you're not going to sell lots and lots of telescopes and make lots and lots of money if you tell everyone else how yeah, to build their own research. So that was perhaps another question that I had. Yeah. That, that's the second. The third 
what that struck me was um, th this idea that, so, uh, you know, again, Joshua laid it out quite uh, eloquently, the, the fascination in the idea of uh, life elsewhere in the universe. And I think there's an important point there, which is that everyone, I think, all scientists as well, work with the sort of karaoke players at some sense. You work, you know, according to what the view is around you. And the importance in making advances and discoveries is to know when to step out of the more conventional field and think laterally. And the final comment I wanted to make was uh, was a little bit addressed to to Sean. We, we've become fascinated in history, and uh, when <coughs> history has got a separation of some decades from us. Now, I, I did say offline to Sean that at the end of the Hipparchos project in 1997, I had some pieces of the Hipparchos satellite that were, were flight stairs. And I couldn't find anyone to take these. You know, there's, there was no interest at all in something which is fresh off the block. But you can imagine that in a hundred years, you, you know, something like the Harris chronometers or, or, or optical systems or whatever become, you know, very tr treasured. And I just wanted to sort of throw that in the fact that, you know, history is going on around us. And to what extent do we make that effort to? And that brings me just to the final point. It's a similar thing on a similar vein. Um, you look now at a project like Hipparchos or, or, or Gaia. Now, the only things I know is so the only things I can talk about, forgive me. But it wasn't a smooth path to their creation, to selling them to the politicians, to the funders and so on. In fact, it was a very, very rocky path. And, you know, I've written, I didn't write much in my own on, on Hipparchos, but I've written very detailed notes about the development of Gaia. And uh, th this must be surrounding us in all kinds of areas. And to what extent do historians make a sort of proactive effort to grab history while it's unfolding and do something with it before it's too late? I mean, with Herschel, we saw an exceptional character. Goodness knows how you spend all night observing and then the whole day transcribing. You know, this is, uh, and, and socializing and everything else is, Time obviously works in a different way for him than it does for us, but, you know, recording these things and, and uh, recording these stories and making them available, I don't know, it's a challenge, it's an interesting topic to watch history unfolding uh, as we speak. We can look forward to Michael and Gaia and then what? Well, I can't, there's an awful lot of people that uh, I can't yet publish. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how about you? Yes, okay, I, I think I can give some response to Michael's first a question about Herschel's motivations in uh, in keeping the record. I mean, I th I'm pretty. Sh it's it's clear from the record itself that they began as for his own use, uh, and and as he got older and and he and he developed a, a different attitude to it, and he became more wealthy. Of course, um, he he turns to the idea of his legacy and how he's going to secure that, and and so on. So. So what's interesting about having the archive is that as we look through, we can see his own attitude changing through the record that he was keeping. And that brings me on to my second uh, point, which is to echo what Josh said about how lucky we are in having all this material. And I want to pay tribute to the Royal Astronomical Society over the, what is it, what, uh, uh, good, uh, goodness, um, 40 or 50 years that I've been involved, the uh, society has supported the library and the archives and so on. Even my own two-year appointment to set this up uh, is, is indicative of that. And now we have the president uh, with us. Uh, and I know that in his case, we don't need to make this case because of his uh, very active historical interests. But that has been very important. And I think we should be grateful for the society's support. And indeed, you know, the, uh, George's time at the... Uh, at the Heritage uh, uh, Committee. And finally, um, just quickly, I, I wanted to uh, congratulate Wolfgang on bringing our, our Herschelian studies onto a new level of comprehensiveness. I mean, a, a number of people like me have dipped in and done th various things and so on. And um, Wolfgang has taken this large overview and, um, and uh, has been able to bring out new uh, insights because of his um, his ambition 
uh, to, to, to take the, the, the large view and using statistical methods and so on to take us on to a new plane. I want, in fact, at the end now, maybe we'll draw into some more um, uh, specific questions to contradict myself in some ways, or at least step back from that and, and ask Wolfgang a rather specific question, if that's okay. Uh, are you ready, Wolfgang? Um, it's, uh, it's just that um, I was interested in what you said about Herschel and his, and his uh, illustrations. And you showed the, um, those lovely uh, uh, white on black um, images, which I think are from Phil Trans. And uh, you said that, you know, Herschel was a, a fine draftsman. Now, I, I, um, I hadn't found in looking at the originals of these that he was a particularly competent draftsman. I mean, that's, we've been very positive all the way through tonight or today. But, you know, I don't think he was a, he had, he had a great talent with, with, with uh, pencil and, or, or with, with ink. And, but when you look at those drawings, uh, the prints in Phil Trans, they're, they're lovely. So there is a, I, I think there's probably a, a, there must be a process, of course, of mediation between the drawings, the original drawings and the printed output in Phil Trans. And that mediation, of course, involves the engraver and no doubt a process of communication and iteration between Herschel and and the engraver, and often the the original, you know, originator of the of the drawings would be involved in that. We know nothing about that, but it's crucial to the way we see Herschel's um, uh, visual record. And those prints are really lovely. I mean, uh, you know, as you know, they're sort of white out of black. It says, "I tried to look online, but but the resolution, of course, doesn't allow you to see." But it, it looks like a kind of mezzo tint process. You know where where you start with a dark ground and then you lighten it and so on, and they're beautifully done. But that's there's work, there's great deal of work involved in that, and a great deal of communication. So we need to bring in other other um, uh, people who are assisting, not just the team at the telescope, but the team. I mean, this is too early for Bassier, isn't it? Who would have been working with John Herschel? But I, so, and I don't think it's signed. But there is something to be uncovered there. And we could bring in, you know, an expert. Uh, we, I would imagine, on on prints in the in the late eighteenth century to help us with that. Okay, use your mic, yes. Okay, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Herschel was one who fixed the things he observed in maybe in a sketch or so, which is very good and very complete and very showing the the real situation. Uh, next, it was Caroline who copied the original rough drawing to her later records. And in the later records, I've seen it in the, in the, uh, uh, drawings of, of Jupiter yeah. you showed. Uh, it's, uh, Caroline's handwriting and, of course, it's Caroline's drawing. Yeah. So Caroline has, smooth the things are brought in the first step you know, to a m much better maybe view or our image you know, we have seen and then came the engraver of the philosophical transactions here you know, and, and made some, some other things. You see such a development from the original to different steps towards the real published thing and many of these the original things are good are really good. You know? uh, however John Wall much, much better draw than, than will it ever was. Yeah? So Jim is right that uh, maybe it's a bit uh, too too much to say he was uh, like like Rembrandt or so. Yeah? That's the case. Yeah? But he fixed the main features. Yeah? That's essential. When you draw on your telescope, I much experience in that, yeah? and you have not the time. You have the light, the red light, and so you, you see uh, going to the of red light. Yeah? And um, you, you fix the same there in a the telescope. This cannot be, be shouted to, to Caroline. This must be at the telescope. No? In the, maybe for in the early times, not in the later times. During the sweep, there was no draw, no? except one or two. But in the other times, at the 70s, there are many drawings. At the 10th, there are many drawings. And they were pretty good with the original situation. And maybe later, Caroline copied that and made better mistake than then came the producer, you not know, of the magazine or journal. So there are different steps. You know? And so yeah, 
uh, he has the, the eye for the main features. No? And maybe the next morning or in the night, perhaps, as well, these things were better fixed as the text uh, was was uh, uh, manipulated or, or, or filled out with, with the new things which in mind them later, and with not with the telescope at all. And so we have different steps. And so, yes, this is a good question, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, we cannot answer all the questions. I have tried in my book to answer all questions which I had in mind. Maybe in the middle of the night I wrote that. That's not a question. Yeah. Yeah. I have to fix it in the morning like a question. No? <laughs> and, and to see. There is only one question remaining. When did William sleep? <laughs> yeah, well, th thank you. I, 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 um, I, I, I find that completely, con even if it would only take us so far, Wolfgang, I think I, I find that answer completely convincing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have Hilmar Hats. So please, if you have questions to um, any of the panel, or put them on my way, and I can get back which meeting you choose, um, and, and, and we'll see what we do. Please try and stay on sort of a short hand, okay. and, and uh, I will follow them back. And I'll try and find uh, a new hand, actually. Um, I think on there, so you have your hands up. I would do a question. Okay, fine, all right. Mr. Lack, you have to move on. You know what? Carry on, anyway. Come on. Okay, so my question is uh, quite often with technology, something happens and then that something enables the next thing to take place. So, for example, with Herschel and his telescope, it's one of the important components of the glass. So, had a technology break taken place? On manufacturing of production glass that enable him to build the lenses because lenses would be a core component of the telescopes. So, could someone talk about the glass, please, that forms such a key part of those lenses? Yeah, it's silver in the glass. It's key. Well, no, 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 actually, no, I mean, Jim, Jim can talk about this much clearer than me, but it, it's, there's no glass involved. Um, it's cast speculum, which is a metal alloy, which is then polished. Silver glass mirrors are not developed until the mid 19th century. Um, so, uh, I don't know whether Jim wants to, to I mean, it, the, when Jim talks about polishing, it's crucially important to understand that speculum as an alloy, it's very difficult to cast. It's then very difficult to shape the, the correct curve that brings a focus point. It's then very difficult to polish to get it to a clean polish so that you get a crisp image. And then worst of all, Speculum, while being incredibly reflective, tarnishes in air, which means that you have to re-polish your mirrors. You can't just make a mirror, put it at the end of the telescope, and you're done. And this is one of the reasons why traditionally reflecting uh, telescopes have only really worked in the hands of the, the people who made them. And, and there's, there are accounts we don't need to go into, but a lot of people took telescopes that Herschel gave them and didn't ever do much with them. And there's good reason for that, which is that they um, are a real pain in the neck to keep going. And so one of the technological breaks which comes in, which is really important for understanding a change in the whole economy of astronomy in the 19th century, is the development of refracting telescopes thanks to achromatic lenses and this is early late 18th early 19th century you start to be able to make telescopes not using mirrors but using lenses tradition before then you couldn't use lenses because um uh, uh you would you as uh, as you focus light with a lens you also refract it in the same way a prism does so you can't bring light to a focus with a single lens but if you use multiple sandwich lenses ingeniously you can just about do it and so that's one of the reasons why in the 19th century astronomers start moving much more to refracting telescopes. So the Yerkes telescope that um, that Michael showed that was the massive telescope, absolutely ginormous telescope, that uses lenses. That's a refracting telescope. Um, but I don't know whether Jim... Well, Jim should jump in on the mirror business. He knows much more than me. When reflecting telescopes moves and being made in spectrum, being made from glass and mirrors to then be set also for us, which is then they have medium. So the key question is when technologically we can actually 
um, you know, coat the surface, all those mirrors, and so enable glass to be useful. I think that, that was the question, that was my impression. That I yeah. Had. Jim? Yes, well, I, I would just, I didn't hear the question very well. Not all the sun comes through clearly, but I heard the answer very clearly and I agree completely with the answer. So I presume, I presume that's fine. Um, the only thing I would add to the answer is that, um, to Josh's answer is that, of course, Herschel realized this all very well. And, um, he, he would include a polishing machine with, with the, uh, telescopes in, in, we don't know about in all, in all instances, but the King of Spain's, uh, uh, a telescope, for example, included you know, two mirrors, so that you could have one in the mirror in the telescope and one being polished, and the polishing machine. Not that this solved the problem because people still couldn't um, polish very uh, effectively. You could see how how much work it had taken for Herschel to uh, master the t the technique, even with a machine. But nonetheless, that was his answer to Josh's problem. Uh, he he he'd supply a polishing machine. So if you could get polishing as well as observing. Oh, yes. uh, two, two remarks. First, uh, uh, Herschel also made lenses. Now, the first telescope he made for Caroline was one with 1.5 uh, inches aperture. So, uh, and also uh, the, the eyepieces. Uh, on one piece, not the double or, or triple eyepiece we have now, or Remsen or whatever, uh, for single. single uh, uh, eyepieces, so it's normal glass. And so she, he made it all. Set, no? The second thing, uh, is the parabolic mirrors, uh, is, uh, to make you, making a pair of parabolic mirrors is difficult. But even more difficult is to make a plane mirror. Yeah? If you have not a plane mirror for reflecting to the, uh, to Newtonian focus, it's not perfect. You get a worse image. Yeah? And, uh, later he, he solved this problem and later he, he threw out the, the secondary mirror to have a front view, and the front view was over. That's that's the main thing. Okay, Mike. Yeah, just, just a historical point. But I'm not an expert at all in the history of the telescope, but I mean, before Herschel, I mean the therefore the early 1700s, uh, lenses were used for telescopes. I mean, the, the, Herschel was good because he could make mirrors better than anybody else had made mirror and. I knew made a mirror telescope. It had the concept, but it didn't really yeah. make a good telescope. Yeah. Up until the time of it, it was basically refractors. They weren't necessarily very good. And that's why it was an advance. But it was, again, a psychic thing. Lenses, mirrors, lenses, back to, back to, back to mirrors. Back to mirrors. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. There, there are multiple shifts through history because 19th century, you go very much back to lenses. But then in the early 20th century, they go back to mirrors because you can get much more light. The, the problem with, with lenses is that literally by the time you get to the Yerkes, which is just about the largest refracting, not quite, but just about the largest refracting telescope ever made, you've got to grind a glass, multiple glass lenses that are three, three odd feet across and they become so heavy and so fragile that they're very difficult to shape and mount effectively. Whereas actually with mirrors, if, especially if you go to, um, multiple um, component, I don't know what's the word for it, composite mirrors, you can start to go back to building mirror telescopes with very large mirrors that just have much bigger light capacity. So yes, it goes, it goes lenses, mirrors, lenses, mirrors, and I think it's basically stayed mirrors in the 20th century. Yeah, but it's, you have to break them up now. So you have yeah. multiple components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, <coughs> Can I be cheeky and ask two questions whilst I've got the microphone? <laughs> Firstly, I'm an industrial pianist, so I'm very interested by the composition of the speculum and whether that was disclosed in as much detail in those beautiful notebooks about polishing. But I, I, I understand that people like Lord Ross, they, they had to reinvent this recipe every time they, they, they created these speculum mirrors. And my second question is, how, how interesting was Virtual in the variability these or potential variability in these objects that we observe. And, and that kind of occurred to me because there, there was a beautiful drawing of, of the pan shaped nebula, which I think was probably Hubble's variable nebula. And, and if he kind of come back to that object a second time or a third time in his reviews or over that, maybe he could have discovered its variability and speculated around it 100 years before maybe Hubble's experiment. 
So once again, how do we go with the, um, the uh, speculum composition first? Well, well, Jim should definitely, Jim, did you hear the question about the, the speculum recipe? Jim, you hear the question? Well, that, uh, so I didn't hear it very clearly. Um, someone wants the speculum metal recipe. Yes, the, the actual but no, uh, the, the composition. Yes, to, the composition. Uh, um, I haven't found a lot about the composition in Herschel's um, uh, record because I think most of his mirrors, and certainly later on, were cast. So um, obviously, the, the standard, you know, copper, two thirds copper, one third tin. Um, but then there were all these extra little secret ingredients that would be added, um, you know, arsenic or whatever. And I don't honestly know. I don't know if Wolfgang or anyone else has picked up on this. I don't really know uh, whether he had one, any any little secrets like that or, or stuck to them or not. But um, uh, the, the the record itself deals mostly with um, with with the technique of polishing. Yeah, actually, it's, it's brass, hmm? brass, hmm? But copper and tin. Uh, a bit of arsenic uh, was, was mixed into, as far as I know. And Lord Ross has uh, uh, maybe things brought to the limit you know, of, of what is, uh, what have to be done to get the highest reflectivity. And the reflectivity, reflectivity was pretty high, not so high like cylinder, but, but comparable. You had no, uh, Maybe and once you, you think of a, a red image or so, that was not the case. It was a clear silver like image you have or, or bright image. No? So the maybe maybe about yeah. 70 or 75 percent. No? So high, no, very high. Uh, no comparable to the later glass on the to coal and then with the silver covering. Uh, the other question of the, uh, how very Nebula and the 2261 in, in Monosodus. Uh, he saw the, the star emanate, which, which emanates the, the, uh, the nebula or enlightens more or less. Yeah. Nebula is the reflection of it. And, uh, now he, he did see some bright variable stars, but, uh, this variable nebula needs more attention. There was no further, or maybe one further, uh, uh, thing or, or uh, uh, observation uh, of the of the object. So uh, what what he did see or believe to see is our very great variations in Orion uh, comparing over the years. Uh, but this is also an illusion. Uh, it's, there's no chance now of, of of masses uh, moving or or enlightening or so by the star maybe the the uh, trapezium in the center. Uh, so there is no chance for him. Or was no chance for him to see a real variable nebula. They are very, very seldom, you know, so a rare case. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Just a quick note on the variability. It's important also to note that William Herschel himself was confident of the fact that because of the nature of having to polish and repolish his mirrors, that the instrument itself was not a stable entity through time. And he says, these instruments have played tricks on me many times. Mm -hmm. And you notice in his quote about the potential of seeing variations of a forest on the moon, he, in making that note, he recognizes this could be an artifact of the instrument. And it's one of the great challenges he faces is that one night he'll polish up the mirror and he'll have this perfect, wonderful image and he'll see it around and he'll see these features. Go back with the same instrument six months later. It's not the same instrument. And Herschel is entirely cognizant of that fact, and it creates a huge amount of trouble for him. And he 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 talks about the instrument almost like it's a, a an unruly pet that he has to kind of keep under control and keep and manage over time. And he therefore knows that he can't assume if he sees a nebula and it looks different to how he last saw it, he can't assume that that's actually a change in in the nebula. Yeah. Yeah. It just it really affected the uh, speculum reflector was William Lassell of Liverpool. So he had no commercial interest whatsoever. He was a rich and he, he, he described he made the composition of these mirrors from the finest apothecary's tin and copper bolts from old ships where the the long action of the sea had somehow however, made the copper better than it was when you just buy it. 
He made several telescopes. He made a superb 24 inch, which confirmed the discovery of Neptune in 1846. And he also built a superb 48 inch. They were absolutely magnificent instruments. And they did not actually tarnish very quickly because of the purity of the materials we used in them. And William, Her and William Lasso tells us how he made these things. And he actually ground them on special machines, not by his hands, but special steam powered machines, which he describes in detail where he got the geometry in the perfect character. And he was at the very, very end of the speculum age. 1840s. Thank you. No, no, sir. Yes, sir. Good Frank Nicholas. Thomas Brown. Six inch acid dating from about 1840, which was before the introduction of Kilbrother. And uh, the mirrors have never been repolished, and they are still brilliantly silver white now. So, the, uh, I'm sorry to slight contradict some of what we said. Um, it is not inevitable to expect a man to time trip. It is not at all. Um, and I think probably the, the essence thing, as, as Alan said, is in purity of material. Um, but also in composition. <clears throat> the 18th century makers were you know, very given to secret ingredients, X's and a um, bit of zinc, a little bit of silver, a bit of arsenic and so on. Um, you know, metallurgy is, is a dark art, and uh, the number of variables is, is so great that um, you cannot anticipate exactly what properties of metal will be um, until you actually try it. And, and I think probably a secret was actually simply the ratio between copper and tin. It's not um, these, these extra things, but clearly, if you got it right, you could get a metal that did not touch. Um, but that, that you know, was quite clearly going to be very You can see that back, um, right, as cast men, is still just as bright. And that's certainly very important. Um, and also, actually, the um, Herschel's seven foot in the Museum of History of Science in Oxford. If you look down to that, I think, Jim, isn't that right? The, the mirror is still pretty bright. Um, and that presumably has not been repolished in a decent hundred years. Yeah. Jim, would you respond to that? Or, um... Yes, I think the, that's true of the seven foot in Oxford. Uh, is it the case, somebody who knows more about this than me, that, that, that tarnishing reaches a a sort of stable level that there's maybe a patina that protects it. I don't know, but I, during the time I was there, I didn't notice any deterioration. That was a relatively short period, of course, but um, I agree that the um, the polish isn't isn't bad. It's been well looked after, of course, in a museum environment and and has a cover and so on. So um, it's not too surprising. But um, I, does anyone know whether they reach a, a stable state, relatively speaking? No, we're all too young to know that. Shall we, shall we, shall we move? Um, okay, thank you very much. You see, you had a question, I keep on thinking about you. <laughs> so, um, it's been a fascinating day. Um, the one thing that really struck me was the, um, the star count method. Or taking the cross section, cross circle, or of the Milky Way. Was that a novel idea of Williams? Because oh, I mean, that seems to me a, a quite a remarkable intellectual leap. It was a, it was a novel, novel method. Yes, he, he invented uh, stellar statistics, you know, which you can say a lot of, no? yeah. uh, and, and use now. No? It, it's his method no, of, of uh, the, the actual. Uh, formula he developed is, is pretty simple, but uh, ingenious uh, to to get from the field of view and the number of stars the actual uh, distance to the uh, to the edge of the of the of the view, uh, maybe boundary of the view. I, I, I can tell you how it works, or you can look into my book. But uh, it's ingenious. Um, anyway. Before I forget, can I can I have a, a remark, yeah. which uh, uh, 
is uh, following his uh, Neptune remark you make. Uh, so we all know that Uranus was uh, discovered by Herschel. And one of my questions I have maybe around in mind, why did he not see or discover Neptune? Or why did he not discover Ceres, Nepalus, Vesta, or Juno, or the first four asteroids? No? So I developed a software tool to get the positions nearest ever in his, his time of history, in, but when speaking, uh, uh, over 20 years, nearest to one of these uh, celestial objects. And there are several close encounters to Neptune, no? and mystified by maybe under one degree. No? And Neptune was surely in his 20 feet, seeable as a small disk. No? So this was all the same like, like the original Neptune discovery no? in a Berlin refractor. No? It was the same image, no? more or less, no sailor country. So it would be that Russia <coughs> even found more things and more ingenious and more incredible things uh, what we believe now. And so that's before I forgot it, I have to get that. Okay, another can you a new hand, please. Uh, well, you're... No, no, no. well, you're running out of the oh, on, on exactly what we're actually saying. I mean, it's one of the Perhaps it highlights the one lacuna in, in William's seemingly endless um, genius. Was, um, of course, ultimately, Neptune is discovered because of mathematical work. Its location is predicted mathematically because of the, the oddities in the orbit of Uranus. And so is it the case that maybe that's the one thing that Herschel didn't have in his toolkit? I genuinely don't know how good or bad a mathematician William Herschel was, but we haven't heard much today in terms of whether he used mathematical theory. Obviously, it's necessary for recognizing that an object is a comet or a, a planet. Uh, so William was not an ingenious math mathematic uh, man, so uh, there were many others, no? <laughs> much higher educated in mathematics. And he can uh, normally the uh, logarithmic, logarithmic uh, tables, use of tables or so, no, and so you see it in, in every, you, you know, these, these uh, calculations in, in the records we have, you know, in the small pieces of paper, you know, which we have is filled with mathematical formula, but they are pretty low you know, compared to, to nowadays uh, mathematics. So it's not, not this, this case. And oh, of course, he, he educated uh, Caroline to do the mathematical uh, uh, things there. They were not on a very high level, so she could, could make it up. As well as him, no? so there was no, no difference. No? But what what is the difference is that, that uh, William had the ingenious mind no? to think about things, which could be maybe uh, end in a formula. So, no? but the formulas were pretty easy. No? Uh, it's not not a mathematical uh, problem, but it's a problem uh, to think about and a question and the answer. No? I see your question. Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask the panel. What they would ask William Herschel. <laughs> He's come back to life. He's here. What one question would you like to ask him? Or what would you like to tell him about what we've done now? How how many hours do you have sleep or ten seconds like Can I reinterpret you that's for the short question and So yeah. any other offers about the sleep one? Sean, I think. Right. Yeah, um, what difference was he on? Was probably <laughs> I, the one I'd like to ask him is, you know, these mm -hmm. nebula you've been observing, do you, haven't you really thought really hard, long and hard about whether they are other universes and whether, why don't you pursue that? Because, and he thought it, but I don't know, I haven't really thought about it in great detail, but probably there just wasn't available any way at that time to push that forward. You could discover more of these. But you had no way of, of getting their distances or learning about them. You, you could speculate. Yeah. Well, Kant, Kant had said that, that nebulae could be other entire universes. And so Newton, it, was, Newton, it wasn't an unknown no, idea. And Newton had also had the idea that maybe, you know, there were all these stellar things distributed throughout entire space. Um, and I suppose if you want to say what I'd like to tell him, he said, yeah, they are. Yeah, that's right. 
got a slightly dodgy question and imagine that Caroline Herschel is in the room as well and say, do you feel ready to talk about the years covered by the autobiographical notes and diaries that you destroyed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, do you have a question for Mr. Herschel? Sorry, you're looking at me. Yeah. Uh, do you have I, a question? Can I? I do you have a question? Do you have any person just walked into the room? What do you ask him? <laughs> do, do you have a question? Is, is there a question for me? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing very well. William Herschel has just walked into the room. Yes. What do you want to ask him? Oh, <laughs> um, right. Uh, goodness. Um, you put me on the spot. Um, uh, nothing, nothing particularly <laughs> coming to me. Um, yeah, no, I need a bit of notice for that. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm learning out of inspiration. Sorry, uh, uh, Another question, please. Again, a new hand. You said yes. Thanks. So we had a telescope on ground named after William Herschel. We've had an infrared telescope named after him. There might even be a Uranus mission named after him. But following on from Sue's point, if he was sitting in the room, do we have any feeling about? What aspect of his astronomy he was most proud of, especially looking back over the 200 years that's since gone on from his legacy? Well, I mean, funnily enough, when I was thinking, if I had to ask the previous question, what I would ask him was that exact question, because if you look at particularly people, other people, as I say, who, who, who really have done the work on Herschel's interest in extraterrestrial life, particularly Michael Crow has argued that he thinks it's actually a really vital part of why he did astronomy, not just at the beginning, but for his whole career as an observer, that the, the desire to prove the existence of extraterrestrial life is something that really drove him on. But we don't ever really see in his, his written records, publications, a clear articulation of, of what it is that's driving him and why he's observing what he's observing. Because one of the things that Wolfgang shows is that he's, he's really changing around. He does a lot of observations of solar system bodies. We all really, a lot of historical time focuses on the nebulae work, but actually if you look at the, the time and the publications, the, the, the nebulae work is only one kind of part of this incredibly diverse range of practices. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't have a, a particularly strong sense because I don't feel like he ever explicitly articulated it, but maybe I'm not. So I actually hear about it. As my old friend, the late Michael Hoskin, said in the film, George Sipley, uh, or the interview, George Sipley, uh, film, uh, he said it's the construction to him. That's the, the, the leading point. Maybe all other, in my mind, is 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 sub, yeah. And uh, that's why he has the star gauges. That's why he has the the impressions of a Milky Way with uh, with some boundary or so, yeah? and and the stellar system. How is it formed? You know, with with clusters, uh, nebula, and stars, and maybe solar system. Many other solar systems, perhaps, no? and maybe inhabitants. No? Uh, so this is my view of the question. Thank you. Okay, another question, Mars. Again, from you, hand, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Sharon, you uh, showed a document with Caroline Herschel's observation of a new comet, and there was the numbers on there 1657, 1605, which I took a bit 24 hour clock. I don't know whether that's right or not. But if it was, that suggests that she was doing some daytime observation at 4 p.m. in April. Uh, was there any evidence they did daytime observation? Well, they certainly carried out daytime observations of the sun. That's a bit of a, a cheap answer. Um, I I just took the um, the time. Of oh, 1657 for granted. I didn't even think about actually how relatively light in the day it would be at that time. 
Perhaps. Independent. He, do you think so? Uh, there are eight other states, Look first. which are possible today. To, you know where it is. You can take your telescope or even a simple uh, tube per se, you know, to, to see on a, on a, on a clear day. There's no problem with that. The document, I guess. They might have been right ascension. Yeah. Uh, pardon? They might have been right ascension. Yes. Yeah, you position, you must know the position. Right, it's, it's, it's not the American uh, no, to, to a local uh, seas spotted. Um, a comet, of course, you know, where maybe but bright comets in the evening or in the morning, so on. And so they, they, they started very early, you know, and to see the bright stars for orientation, for, for uh, checking the, the observing conditions you know, for the night, you know, to see. You know, and all the things, and they started very early. And you must know if you to see the records, then you must uh, strictly see what time is met. You know, it's different. Normally, uh, often the green trees are green tree times meant, but most often uh, the sidereal times is meant. Uh, so you can see, okay, sidereal time uh, eleven o'clock you know, uh, in the day. You know, that's possible. You know, so you must uh, strictly see uh, on the sources. Uh, well, maybe we have time for one final question. A very short one, please. Anybody? Jim. Yeah. Yes? Hi. Jim Benning. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it, it's just that I feel I, I, I let you down by not ans asking William Herschel a question. And I think <laughs> now I've decided now I, that, I, <laughs> that I would ask him, did you enjoy George's film? That's what I'd like to do. <laughs> oh. I didn't have to do no to him. Let's finish there. Thank you for our panel. Thank you for all the questions. And uh, see if we keep a good one tonight if we want. So, um, uh, can I thank the panel? Who's the last one? The closing jokes to tell us about the passion. And very mindful. Yeah, that's in humor. Yeah. Uh, whilst I'm not actually telling jokes as such, what we've had this morning, of course, about the personal telescopes and the big open frames, my comments about how many broken necks did it generate? I want to wonder what health and safety would have made. So, whilst we don't have any that help with Williams' telescope, we do know that when in South Africa, and when the 18 inch was taken to Cape Town, that the Herschel's had a number of very clear missings. And these came from dangerous creatures. William tells us, I mean, Joe tells us, that on some occasions, snakes would come up the ladder, <laughs> out of the grass. And there you are, up there. Peter <laughs> Bingo. What do you do? Also, there were large numbers of cats, of feral dogs, escaped from the local farms. And you could be sometimes coming down the ladder, and they smelt fresh meat for supper. <laughs> what did he do? He started to take with him, he tells us, a double barreled pistol, <laughs> loaded with buckshot, percussion locks, Bang! I'll say it right away. And they enjoyed what they called picnics. Not a picnic like today, but the picnic. And he and Margaret and the family would go to a favourite luncheon bit for a picnic. But sometimes you'd see in the bushes around. Dire, smelling supper. So he always took with him a rifle. And so when they were tucking into their cucumber sandwiches, and he had bang! I don't know if any of you fancy that sort of a picnic, but that's the sort of the hostels had in South Africa. So very bad, poisonous states, feral dogs, and lions. And it's been an enormous pleasure to be here and to talk to you at this wonderful, wonderful learning on solo. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
That's me now, briefly, and I stand now between you and your wife, so I'll be even brief. Um, two things. Um, one is that we think uh, our speaker was supposed to have a huge reward for the effort they've made. Um, and happily, um, I had a source of that reward in the form of something that Michael Kern referred to, because you may see he uh, showed a picture of the Herschel Arms uh, in a uh, pub in Slam. And this is uh, run by an engaging Irishman called Tom King. And you realize that uh, they're almost every street in Slough is called Hersh. Not much said about it, because the and the public too did. And and he decided to celebrate um the two year anniversary by making a Stargazer Bills map <laughs> and selling it with his custom big games, custom bottles. So I'll be presenting a bottle each to each of our speakers and oh, I'll play the Lord before they are out. And uh, I go on the museum as well, so that um, that can be archived properly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go back and later. Uh, the second thing is that um the world here had a wonderful idea about running a competition to sort of help publicize um this event. Um and uh we did, we debated what the you know, the competition should be. But what we decided the best thing to do is to know who is the to on that and why. And um, the point behind the question is an open question, and it's really impossible because uh, how do you find your terms? <laughs> no different answer. So, um, and uh, and Tony, Tony, Tony Stein and I back got the answers to that. Um, I don't speak, and we sort of you know, exchanged, um, sure. we exchanged our views about them and sort of came to a few. So there were 23 entries, and we were going for the best answer, but I'll tell you roughly which astronomers got the best. And it wasn't, it wasn't a democratic thing. So Galileo got six, Hubble got three, Kepler got two, and um, Lieber Henry as well, Lieber got two, uh, Pimpernicus got one, Horrocks got one, Justin Galvanel got one, uh, Charles Zucker got one, Ari Abate got one, Tiger Brahe got one, uh, John Barrow got one, actually more got one, and Hugh Manessi got one. I think that's a sort of curious thing. Mm. Now, so you see about that, who, who, whose name wasn't in there? <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, I don't think you actually went into the competition because you yourself said earlier on that no one was arguing with Vegas, but all astronomers. So, so I know, I'm certainly not expecting what would happen with that, which is that we get a lot of pressure for these and non nationals and we'd make some sort of choice and be sat there in time to find the objective, but the problem didn't arise. No urgence. <laughs> so those people who uh, entered those answers clearly should have been here today. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe they were hard, perhaps they didn't give. I mean, she choose um, one in the end. And essentially, there are three pretty, pretty good arguments in favour of Galileo or Kepler or Hull. But the one we went for in the end was the Hull, and uh, by a person whose name I'll probably mispronounce, uh, actually, Kiai Naik, and I don't even know what gender to apply. So the, 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 the rationale was, I regard him in Hull as one of the greatest astronomers of all time, who completely altered our perspective on humans. Kepler did a similar job with his heliocentric model. However, the observations by Hubble reveal a truly unfash- unfathomable uh, scale of the universe we live in. By establishing the fact that the neighbourhood structures that astronomers observed centuries were in fact places like our own moving really apart from each other, was pivotal in the development of cosmology if you want in the right way. The preconceived mo- notion of a static universe, which was believed by the European mind in the 16th century, not a question, I do, um, question, she was shattered with this elegant piece of astronomical work on the whole. This venture formula and the whole constant gave us a simple and convenient tool to calculate large cosmic distances and recessional velocities just from the redshift. Considering all these contributions, I believe Edward Edwin Hubble is still the greatest astronomer of all time. So you know, well, well, well done, uh, Jim King and I. And the prize competition is a tour you know, with me around the Herschel Museum. So I'll see if I can persuade him that uh, maybe Herschel should be. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, well, well done, and thank you for all the work for the competition. Um, it remains for me just to thank everyone who's been able today to happen. I mean, thank you most of all to our speakers, now both Jim online and everybody here, who have given us a tremendous, um, a tremendous sort of tour of passion learning about him. Um, 
thank you um, uh, to the people who helped me actually set this up. I mean, you know, my, my committee, uh, my society, and in particular, I don't think people names up, my elements has been a key person in sort of framing how we do this, who we invite, how we manage it. I'm just asking the old big question from time to time, which I've had something. I can tell you Simon's the back there too, uh, because he's been a key person in actually enabling what's to happen and do all the mechanics and make that thing work. And it's a very difficult and frustrating thing. So Tony, I couldn't have done it without you. And I appreciate that. Thank you for the royalty staff. Um, Andreas Hansmund and Curie and, and Fan and Ellen, with that out of the back, uh, who've made it needs to happen, has been a, a really good cooperation with Brilzy from, from my point of view. Um, and it's a, it's a great institution, I'm very happy to call it. And thank you for all of you for buying tickets <laughs> and coming and, 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 and making such a great day. So thank you all very much. Um, uh, the wine is now there. <laughs> Before we go to the wine, there's one person you haven't thanked who you can't thank through modesty, yeah. and that is to thank yourselves because the driving force behind this has been yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all for being great players. And um, as, as Michael Hoskins said, the more you get talk, know, learn about passion, the more you like them, actually. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs>